Hi, Tyler. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm going to talk about what happened, what it was like, and what it's like now. <laughs> I always feel so cliche saying that because, like, everybody says that. But, um, yeah, so I really feel like, um, for me, I was uh, born an alcoholic. My earliest memories, I just, I know that um, I always felt like I was kind of watching myself from everybody else's eyes and not really having an identity. And um, I grew up in a divorced home. And so very quickly, I learned how to manipulate between houses and get my way and, and uh, dis display like the alcoholic behavior and and using basically lies to get what I want from each parent and um, also learning how to run away from my consequences. So very early on, I just, I, I had those types of uh, tendencies. Um, and I always, always, always felt different than everybody else. I always felt unique in some sort of way. Um, so through grade school, I kind of was like that. I, I, I got bullied a lot. I, I didn't really, you know, have too many friends. Um, when I took my first drink, I was 13, and I took it alcoholically. I, um, I remember my older brother wouldn't let me go to a party with him, so I got really pissed off, and I went to where my mom, like, hid her vodka, and I just poured like half the cup full of vodka and then the rest of the half of the cup with OJ. And um, I got super wasted and just walked it throughout the neighborhood and found the party where my brother was at and got more drunk with the friends. But I, I drank out of anger. Like my first drink was alcoholically drank. Like I didn't drink because I was having fun. I didn't drink because other people were doing it. Like I drank alone because I was pissed off. And it instantly made me feel better. It instantly made me feel like things that were always constantly on my mind were no longer on my mind. It was just that instant relief that we all like crave. So um, that pretty much kick started it. I mean, it started at 13, but I always sought that. I was, I always would start sneaking my mom's vodka and replacing it with water and, um, since I was like, you know, I felt cooler when I was, uh, drinking my, my older brother's friends, like, let me go to parties. So I very quickly, like, got into the party scene. Um, and throughout high school, my mom worked through, my mom worked in the bars. So she was always gone to like two or three, sometimes 4am. Um, so like my house very quickly became known as the party house and like every weekend I'd have like all my friends over I'd even have people I didn't even know over like pretty much the whole and then once I got to like senior year like the whole senior class would come over and just we would rage in my backyard and throughout the house things would get stolen I didn't give a shit because I thought I had friends you know I didn't really I didn't really care too much about um my mom or the house or you know I was very selfish self-seeking I just wanted to you know, get fucked up and, and do what I wanted to do on my terms. Um, I remember one time I had this, I was pretty crafty too. Like I really, I rarely ever got caught. I was really good. But I remember this one time I got busted was because I had like this, I had this rave at my house one time and um, everybody was like doing Molly and ecstasy. I was just drinking. I had never experimented with that in high school and um but it was it was a crazy party and the what got me caught was the next day my mom was like where the fuck are all the shoelaces like all the shoelaces on all the shoes in the house were gone because they took the shoelaces and like tied them to glow sticks so they could do like glow stick maneuvers or whatever you want to call it so that's how i got busted was uh there was no shoelaces on any of the shoes in the house so i thought that was kind of funny but um you know, through high school too, I lived this huge double life. Like I was basically hiding the fact that I was gay and I was trying to like date girls and, and be somebody that I wasn't. So I think, you know, for me, that really, 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 really um, contributed to 
the whole lying and the whole double life. And, and when I drank, it took that away. It took away that, that constant fear of like, oh my God, that I sound gay when I said that, or oh my God, do, did I do like a gay gesture? Or, are they calling me gay because I'm stupid? Or are they calling me gay because they actually think I'm gay? Like all those obsessive thoughts were a huge reason why I drank and like social settings were never, I could never do social settings because I always felt like everyone was looking at me and I always felt like, you know, everyone was out to get me. I just had these like insane thoughts all the time. And that's why I love to drink because it quieted them down and I never had to worry. And I felt like the man girls wanted me, at least I thought. <laughs> um, so that was a huge reason why my drinking got so out of control when I was in high school. Um, so eventually I, I, you know, I came to terms with my sexuality. I, I came out and it was uh, a pretty freeing experience. You know, I felt like, holy shit, I'm out now. Like, I don't have to drink like this anymore. Like, I can just be myself. Well, that didn't happen. I, uh, I worked in the restaurant business for a while and um, I was a busser in a bar back and uh, I would basically just I was about 19 or 20, 19 and 20 when I worked there and everybody else was older. And it was like the culture was to drink on the job and to do fucking cocaine on the job. And, and I remember the, it was new year's Eve and I got way too drunk. And this guy that I worked with, he was like, come on, Tyler, we gotta, we gotta sober you up. I was like, what are we going to do? And so he took me to the bathroom and I did my first line of cocaine when I was 19. And, um, I loved it cause I could just drink again. I was like, I got a reset and I got a, a whole new start to the night. And it was like the best thing ever, at least for me. Um, and so that was like pretty much the first time I ever really messed around with drugs. <clears throat> um, so yeah, once I came out, I, I had this fascination with like gay culture and I was like, oh, I want to get like into gay culture. I want to know like what it's all about and everything like that. So I ended up getting a serving job at this gay resort. It's called the Flamingo in, in um, St. Pete, Florida. And uh, I was 19 when I started there. And um, I had never been around re really like gay people at this point in my life. I had like, you know, apps and stuff that like let me chat with people online, but I never like was in a place with a whole bunch of gay people. And I kind of, found out that, you know, I was decent looking because of the attention that I was getting. I had never gotten attention like that from girls. And I was getting all this attention from all these guys and free drinks. And it became that in a, in a way became a drug for me, like the attention that I would get from other people and the manipulation that I could, that I could use, you know, using my body to get what I want. And it just became such a toxic time of my life. Um, so I, I started serving there and I sucked at it. Like I multiple times would get like zero dollar tips um, for my tables. <laughs> and I would like, and of course I would drink about it because it's like, I don't know. It just, it wasn't for me. But one of the nights that um, I made like $10 for after working, I think a four hour shift. And I was so pissed off. My friend was like, all right, let's go to the code. And there's this place called code. It was like a little club in the resort. It was like the dark, dirty club. And um, they had like porn playing on the wall. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. Really dirty club. And um, I got really wasted and just, uh, I ended up getting in my underwear and dancing on stage just because I was really drunk. And I ended up making like $200 in an hour. So um, the owner of the club came up to me and was like, okay, well, I think you should be dancing, not serving because you made all this money and, you know, your energy and blah, blah, blah. So whatever. So I became a stripper. <laughs> and, um, and the first night I ever stripped was like officially was the first night I ever did Molly. And... I don't know if anybody doesn't know what Molly is. It's just like, it's kind of the same thing as ecstasy. Just, I guess, supposedly more pure, just MDMA. Um, and that kind of was the first night of the next two or three years of my life. I didn't continue, you know, stripping. Um, Cause stripping, you know, it, it put me in very dangerous situations and, 
And for me, you know, at the time it was perfect. I was 19, 20 years old. I wasn't legally able to drink. So, and they would give me free drinks all night. So it just fueled my alcoholism, to be honest. And all the attention I was getting on top of that, it was just like the perfect storm for me. And um, I ended up starting to abuse Molly. And then the Molly was like laced with meth. And then so I was doing like Molly and meth. And then I was doing... I was popping beans all the time. And during this part of my life, I just, I wasn't even drinking really. It just was so drug infested. And um, it destroyed me, man. It, uh, it, it robbed me of pretty much all the decency I had. I got, I was in re- some really messed up situations because of what I was putting myself, what the kind of like, the kind of like situations I was putting myself in. I was basically just subjected to some really fucked up shit i'll put i'll put it like that and uh you know it still things to this day that i have to work through you know what i mean so i stopped doing that and um you know i i ended up losing my job those things started to happen to me like i started it started to be where i couldn't not drink anymore and i couldn't not use anymore and um, I was even dating this guy and he was like, I just wish you were on Molly all the time because I hate who you are when you're sober. And it was one of the most like detrimental things I had ever heard at the time. Cause I was just like, damn, well I hate me sober too. I just want to be fucked up all the time. And it was like this reinforcement of like, this is who I, this is who drugs make me who I want to be and alcohol makes me who I want to be. And I hate who I am on the regular. You know what I mean? So that's when it started getting into keeping the airplane bottles in the car and drinking before work. And, um, I ended up getting fired from a job and then I went back to the restaurant business because I got out of the stripping and the restaurants and I got a corporate job and then I ended up losing that job. And, uh, having to move back in with my parents and then getting another restaurant job. Well, I was messed up all the time and they could tell. So they fired me. And, um, that was the time when, you know, shit got really dark. And I was just, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to St. Pete or Tampa or Sarasota, but I basically, after I started losing everything, I just was like ready to die. So I was going to drive to, um, the Skyway bridge to go jump and something, they call it like God moments or higher power moments or whatever you really identify with. Um, my mom called me when I was by the bridge and she it was just random. Like she was just talking. She wanted to see how I was doing. And, and um, I broke out. Like I talked to her about everything. Like I let my guard down completely. I told her what was going on. I told her how I felt. I told her how much I was using and she suspected anyway. I mean, she, she, she found me like naked, like sleeping around the toilet one time soon before that. But anyway, um, so I kind of told her everything that happened and then she convinced me to come home. She bribed me with like homemade mac and cheese and she was going to like cook me all this food and like, that's the way to my heart is food. So she, and she knows that. So she got me to come back home and, um, and then she Baker acted me. <laughs> so then I went to the psych ward. Um, it was there where I met some other alcoholics, basically, who were detoxing. And then I found out about AA. So that was my first time going into AA it was right after the psych ward. I had just got out of the psych ward. And I, uh, I can't remember if I drove myself or how the hell I even got there. But I got there. And my first sponsor... Um, I was sitting in the meeting. I can't even imagine how I looked. I probably looked like a mess, but I raised my hand for a white chip and my first sponsor straight up told me, he was like, Hey, let's take a walk. Super old school guy. And, um, he told me his story or whatever. And then he was like, all right, so I'm going to be your sponsor. And then this is where you're going to meet me tomorrow. And, uh, he kept me. So, I mean, I, I stayed sober that time, probably about two months. I never made it to 90 days. Um, but you know, I, 
I just wasn't ready. I was 21, 22. And there's a lot of people that get sober at that age. But for me, I just wasn't ready to get sober. So I went back out. And for the next couple of years or so, I would teeter in and out of AA and um, want to get sober. And then when things would start to get better a little bit, I would go back out. And then it was a constant cycle of building myself up and then breaking myself down, like that whole self-destruction type of thing. Um, so yeah, and every time that I would go back out, it would my disease would take a different form. It would progress and different drugs would, would get introduced or different types of alcohol. I mean, I had a huge boxed wine phase there for a little bit. Um, and then I just remember it eventually getting to a point where I couldn't even wake up and not think about drinking. I couldn't even wake up and not drink because I would physically just get to a point where I would feel sick and I would be afraid that I would have a seizure. Um, it didn't last very long. I really, I really am good with like, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really good with like knowing when I need to change. My problem is like, I always forget about how bad shit gets. And um, this time around, you know, when I found out that I, I really got bad, it was when I took PTO and I, I canceled my whole vacation that I had planned for Texas because all I wanted to do was isolate and sit at home and drink and drink and drink and drink. I couldn't even leave my house. Like I was ordering my alcohol off of um, this thing called Drizzly where it's like Uber Eats, but for liquor. And so I would literally just, I, cause I was so embarrassed to be, I was going to the liquor store multiple times a day. You know what I mean? And like the liquor store people were probably like, this fucking kid needs help. Like, and so I was embarrassed. There was three liquor stores in the area that I would hit. And I would go to this one and then I would go to that one and then I'd go to the other one. And then by the time I had made my round, I'm just like, well, I can't go back there. So yeah. And then I wouldn't even, I, I was, I ran out of groceries. Like I had no groceries left anymore. So I would just order pizza and then make the pizza last for like a couple of days until I needed to order more. So this, that's where I was at. Like completely demoralized. I didn't give a shit about my health. I didn't give a shit about fitness anymore. Like, meal prepping, none of that. Like I just wanted to be fucked up constantly and not think, not feel. And the only way I could do that is if I would black out because, you know, alcohol at that point stopped working. It, it literally stopped working and it just would make things worse. But if I was completely in oblivion, then I wouldn't have to feel anything. Um, so I eventually, I started researching um, like treatment facilities and everything like that. And I stumbled upon this place called Novus Detox. So I went to Novus, I detoxed for seven days and it gave me hope. It was the first time I kind of had hope and like a lot of support and medical help. And um, they, they referred me to a place called Hazelden. Hazelden down in Naples is literally like paradise. The food gets delivered to you. It's, you can have your phone and stuff. It's really laid back compared to a lot of other places, but the one thing that I really found in Hazelden was my spiritual foundation, steps one, two, and three. And um, very quickly, I started noticing that I had hope this time. And I was able to meet so many amazing people who had the same type of mentality and the same yearning for recovery in Naples. And um, yeah, I actually met my... Uh, I met my sponsor too, who ended up being one of the most important people in my recovery. Cause at the point when I was at Hazelden, you know, like I had just given up on people. I had given up on trusting people because of things that have happened in my past. And I felt like everybody always had like some type of a motive and, and right off the bat, I didn't trust you right off the bat. I was like, all right, what does this motherfucker want? Um, or what can I get from this person? Like, that's how, my, that's how my thinking was. And this person, when I was freaking out, and I, one of my character defects is like, I like to 
take out anger from something else on a person that it's completely unrelated to. And I was dishing this out to this guy who was my sponsor and he was just taking it and he was killing me with kindness. And he was like, I'll never forget. He said, I love you. I'm not, and I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to give up on you. And, um, that completely shut me down because I hadn't heard that from anyone in a long time. You know, I was such a shithead and, and I, um, it just, it hit me in a really profound way. And I'm kind of like losing my train of thought here. Um, yeah, so I mean, upon that happening anyway, um, I started working through the steps with this guy. And uh, he was the type of sponsor. He was just like, no bullshit. So, and, and I wasn't working at the time. So it was just like, um, my full-time gig was recovery, which, uh, so for 90 days, I just basically did nothing but like work the steps, fellowship, um, you know, get to know people, sober people and, and build a fellowship and build a foundation. And I'm super thankful for that. Um, but it was probably when I went through like steps four through nine, where I started to genuinely like look at people and be like, I have this, I have this love for you. And I, I genuinely like can look at a person and not be like, what can I get from this person? You know what I mean? I can genuinely be like, I want to help this person. There's no more self seeking. There's no more selfishness. There's no more like manipulation. Um, I can look at myself in the mirror today. I have a higher power that, kind of has my back like it kind of I, I look at it as like having a filtration system and when I have these thoughts that come through that are like negative I always think of it as my addiction talking you know what I mean and um, I'm able to step back from situations and actually see what it is that I need to do and what it is that my addictions telling me to do so it's almost like my first thought is wrong but I have the ability to see that today and I have a, an ability to react in certain way in different ways that um, like help my sobriety. And uh, yeah, I kind of, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. So I, I think I hope I spoke for long enough. So that's all I got. Thanks guys.